am an associate professor of architecture at the Knowlton School of Architecture at The Ohio State University. It is my privilege to welcome all of you to the first lecture of the 2019-2020 Baumer Lecture Series. Our thanks to Eric Herman, Assistant Professor of Architecture, who is the chair of the series and who has assembled a brilliant collection of speakers for us this term, and whose graphic acumen has developed a vibrant, arresting yellow banner that announces our speakers with a cannot miss clarity that it is once assiduous as well as playful. It sets the tone for the fall semester speakers of series of speakers who range from the conceptual to the infrastructure. All of the disciplines within the school are represented in this cast of intellectuals, designers, historians, and theorists, and we are looking forward to an engaging semester. Occasionally, we are privileged to include a speaker who does not quite fit into any of the specific disciplinary definitions of landscape, architecture, or city and regional planning, but instead is an agent who forecasts new definitions of objects, institutions, practices, and protocols that shape space, our interpretation of history, and public engagement. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Schnapp as the first speaker in this year's series. Jeffrey is the founder and faculty director of Harvard University's MetaLab, a group which I have been following with fangirl enthusiasm for several years, which is an idea foundry, knowledge design lab, and production studio experimenting in the networked arts and humanities. Publications from MetaLab range from hypercities and thick mapping to media playbooks for rethinking libraries beyond the physical book and to blueprints for radical pedagogy. The range of thinkers and projects brought together under Jeffrey's enthusiasm is both compelling and clarifying. The MetaLab's projects infuse traditional modes of academic inquiry with an enterprising spirit of hacking, making, and creative research. In addition to the MetaLab, Jeffrey is faculty co-director co of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, Jeffrey currently holds joint appointments between the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, where he is a professor within comparative literatures, as well as of Romance Languages and Literatures, serving as the section leader for Italian, and is on the teaching faculty in the Architecture Department at the Graduate School of Design. Augmenting his already very busy academic career, Jeffrey is also one of the founders um, former CEO and now Chief Visionary Officer of Piaggio Fast Forward, a group which designs lightweight, intelligent mobility solutions for people and goods. In collaboration with Gregory Lin and many others, the company designs robotic suitcases, as was described in a faculty meeting earlier today, which resemble what I think is a cross between roadie which is my two-year-old nephew's favorite bouncy, inflatable Italian donkey toy, and a Roomba. This exhaustive list of appointments, accolades, accomplishments, and affiliations points to a unique and productive mind. Jeffrey works in the domains of media, knowledge design, digital arts and humanities, and curatorial practice. And his list of publications, exhibitions, and awards is impressive. It's hard to point to any one thing that Jeffrey does, but rather a collection of activities, provocations, and transformations within the realms of cultural history, design, and curation. Not just a cross-disciplinary thinker, but an agent who forecasts. The projects Jeffrey initiates between academia, curation, and design practice transform the ways we engage history, objects, and institutions that shape culture. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Schnapp. Um, but uh, it's one that um, hopefully will provide a little bit of context for the hat that I'm going to wear um, in the context of this talk, which is very much focused on the, the question of the, the present and future of mobility, which is to say the hat that I wear as one of the co-founders of a new mobility company called Piaggio Fast Forward. As the name Piaggio probably elicits in your imagination, uh, it's a new company, but it is uh, connected to a 135-year-old company, uh, a company that's known throughout the world for iconic vehicles like the Vespa scooter, 
but also for uh, other light mobility vectors like uh, Moto Guzzi motorcycles and Aprilia motorcycles and a whole number of other brands, Europe's largest uh, uh, two-wheel manufacturer. Um, and what I really like to talk about is what I'm calling movability here, and I'll give, give a little, a few words of explanation about um, the choice of the word. Um, but really, not so much a product, but the way in which an invention, a product, a device, uh, embodies a set of values that cut right to the core of what I see as really fundamental questions, not questions that are resolvable by mere technicians or specialists. When we talk about mobility, we tend to think of it as uh, particularly in the context of uh, discussions about uh, rationalizing traffic flows and so forth, is belonging to some kind of well-defined sector of uh, expertise. But mobility really, and this is now me speaking as the cultural historian, really cuts to the core of everything that we are as a society, as a culture. Uh, uh, we are the way we move, in a sense, and cultures are defined as well as subjectivities are defined by these features. So um, when one enters the world of developing new kinds of mobility models, one is engaged in an activity that spirals out in a multitude of different directions. And the reflection that I want to present to you today is going to be in five main chapters. Um, but maybe I should start with the word movability, which uh, I swear to you is not a word that I made up, actually. It's a word that I found. Um, and because of my uh, my training and practice as a historian, particularly with uh, linguistic orientation, um, when I find words that are suggestive, I find it hard to give them up. And this one I found when, on the occasion of the 130th uh, anniversary of the foundation of the Piaggio Group, uh, a group that has done, long before it produced Vespa scooters, built trains, it built, they built ships, they were the major aircraft manufacturer, they were the number two aircraft manufacturer in the interwar period. Um, I came across this word in uh, conversations uh, uh, about advertising and publicity. Um, and the challenge uh, that really elicited the forging of this word, it was a neologism in Italian, was how do we capture this the kind of exciting, you know, kind of uh, bubbly new model of the way people are moving around the world that's emerging around the Vespa scooter. Vespa scooters were born in 1946. They were the creation of aircraft engineers who hated motorcycles and were forced to give up their, the love of their, the passion of their career, which was to build helicopters and aircraft. They didn't want to make land vehicles. But Italy was on the losing side of World War II. The roads were a mess. People didn't have money in their pockets. They weren't ready to, to, to there, were, there, were, there were not bubble teas, and even if there were, they wouldn't have been able to afford them. So what was the way that Italians, ordinary middle class, working class Italians were going to move around the pockmark landscape of course post-war Italy? That was the challenge that the design team, the team of aeronautical engineers who developed the Vespa, tackled. And they created a vehicle that took off right from the moment it was launched in 46. And people started doing things with Vespas that were not anticipated in the design. The design was supposed to resolve a series of practical problems. They used them as sofas on main squares to hang out. They used them in all kinds of ways that suggested that a new way of moving around the world, a new mobility, set of mobility lifestyles were emerging. And that's what movability, the term movability was used to identify that kind of catalytic effect of a light mobility platform on culture, on society, on habits. Uh, so I, I kind of grabbed onto this word and what I'd like it to signify here in the context of this discussion uh, th this evening is uh, what comes after mobility, the kind of mobility that's defined the world that humanity has inhabited at least since the middle of the 20th century, but during much of the 20th century. What comes after auto mobility? Uh, and what I'm going to argue, and somewhat polemically so, is that this kind of endless discussion about the future of mobility that's centered on self-driving cars is exactly the vision that we have to get away from. And the work that we're doing at Get Out Fast Forward embodies an attempt to kind of formulate an alternative to that vision. And it's an alternative that is deeply infused by a vision of the kinds of cities that we think are the cities that we desire to live in, not the cities where the protagonist will continue to be the automobile. So the five chapters of this uh, presentation here, first of all, I'm going to focus on 
um, the city, the way in which the kind of model of mobility that uh, continues to define urban design today emerged and how it diverged from certain kinds of historical models. Then I'm going to uh, shift gears just briefly to uh, talk a little bit about the alternative vision that I'm associating with the notion of movability. And I should mention that when I discovered this word, I, uh, as part of the book project that came out of the, uh, the research I was doing, I wrote a manifesto, the movability manifesto. So uh, in good futurist form, it's a kind of response to the sort of vision of the future that was articulated in Filippo Tommaso Marinetti's uh, founding manifesto of futurism published in 1909 where famously Marinetti dreams of the hero of the future, which is the 20th century. The century we just went beyond is going to be the man behind the wheel. In other words, not the pedestrian, but rather the man behind the wheel or the pilot. Those are the two models of humanity that ought to be, in a sense, supported by, uh, by the structure and design of cities. And Marinetti um, got his way, for better or for worse. What are the consequences of that? So, what lies beyond mobility? Then I'm going to talk briefly about the robot, the robotic vehicle that you see here, the mobile carrier Gita. Gita means a short trip in Italian, a pleasure, pleasurable trip, a trip on a human scale. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the limits of autonomous driving technology, the limits of autonomous vehicles. Why is it that despite the hype cycle that's been going on now for over a decade, focused entirely on visions of the future where autonomous self-driving vehicles are the protagonists. Why haven't we gotten that? Why, what are the obstacles? And those are obstacles that will bring me to the uh, last section of my talk, which uh, uh, will take us back to GDA and to uh, mobility uh, robotic vehicles like GDA to suggest that the whole question of autonomy needs to be re-anchored, refocused, turned on its head, looked at from a different angle. Uh, as I think you'll discover, I'm not the enemy. I'm not opposed to these technologies. On the contrary, I'm extremely interested and committed to them. But in the service of what and of who? Those are the questions that I'm interested in talking about. OK? All right. So I want to start as a kind of preface with um, a Latin phrase, which I doubt is going to be familiar to many of you, but you might be familiar with the phrase that it's responding to, uh, which takes us back to the uh, 17th century, to a debate, a polemic that took place. Um, the, the, the famous phrase that it's actually echoing, ambulo ergo sum, for those of you who studied Latin in uh, high school, you'll recognize it means, I walk, therefore I am. And the, those are the words of the philosopher and naturalist Pierre Gassendi. Uh, who, in a polemical response to the much more famous uh, phrase, cognito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, which is at the center of René Descartes' uh, discourse on method, responded to Descartes' claim that, that I think, therefore I am, in other words, that mental activity precedes, in a sense, any kind of embodied action that humans perform in the world. In other words, the, the discovery of the world, like the sciences, the knowledge, all those forms of, of, of knowing that humans are capable of performing, starts with mental activity and with an act of self-consciousness. That's what uh, Descartes advanced in his discourse of method through the phrase, I think, therefore I am. And Gassendi, who was a naturalist, said, nonsense. There is no knowing without Moving. Moving around the world is the way we discover things. And the way humans move, it, the, the way that is wired into their very bodies, into our bipedal, our standing form, our physical configuration, is the fact that we walk. As we walk, we discover the world, we interact with things, we interact with other people, uh, we produce knowledge. Um, and Gassendi, of course, he was engaged in a polemic. But he was making a point that is a, a point that actually happens to be true from an evolutionary standpoint. The fact that we have a particular cranial structure, that our brains are the size that they are, that our sensory apparatus works the way it does, and that the brain is deeply interconnected with all of our other sensory systems, um, is entirely conditioned by the fact that we are bipeds and walk on two feet. 
And it perhaps is not a complete surprise then that all of the great forms of philosophical inquiry that shape the Western tradition, uh, that's taken particularly the Western, the, the uh, uh, Western tradition associated with the Aristotelian school, the so-called peripatetic school, is the school where philosophers walked. They talked and walked together. Thinking and moving are closely and deeply correlated. And of course, the way that people move changes over the course of time. The course of uh, the development of different transportation systems and technologies has profoundly shaped the way we move around the world, including uh, the, the rise of war chariots, of different kinds of carts and carriages, uh, uh, mail coaches, uh, um, steamboats, uh, eventually balloons, locomotives, bicycles, etc. All of those different possible ways of enhancing, enhancing and augmenting human mobility have profoundly shaped our interactions with the world. But at the core of all of those forms of movement was always walking. Uh, and it remains so today just as much as it was the case in the era of uh, Aristotle. So here we are in the middle of the 18th century. This is Piranesi's view of Gats and Spagna. Um, and what, what, how do cities respond, reflect this uh, diversity of different ways of moving around the world. Well, I think the city space all the way through into, well into the 20th century was the space, as you can see here, of commingling, where different kinds of ways of moving, whether it's carts, whether it's animals moving alongside humans, along with humans, accompanying humans, uh, and pedestrians all move around and promiscuously interact with one another. And this is the model of urban life that continues to be um, dominant throughout the world. Here we are, we've zoomed forward from Piranesi's Rome to San Francisco, 1906, Market Street, a month or two before the great earthquake of 1906 that's going to devastate this part of the city. And look at Market Street. There are even automobiles in this world of urban uh, transit completely intermingled, without distinction. Carts, horses, people, obviously at a certain peril. But my point here is that even as the automobile revolution began to reshape models of urban circulation, the street was a place of a civic space. It remained a space of interaction, sharing, a, a kind of theater for the society of its own time. Uh, and if you go to Market Street today, you will not see this scene anymore. Market Street is a superhighway right now, where pedestrians are literally on the margin. They have to be disciplined. They have to be controlled because of the speeds of, at which cars are moving and other similar platforms. So how did we get from this model of this kind of promiscuous civic theater that was the, um, the city to the cities that m most of us live in today? And I wanted to show this, just, this is a brief clip from the New York World's Fair in 1939-1940. This is the GM Pavilion, not by accident, designed by one of the great industrial designers of this period, Norman Belgenis. Some of you may know Belgenis' work. He was the author of a book whose title, I think, is, is itself a manifesto, Magic Motorways. And that's what you're seeing here, is the magic, uh, kind of utopian vision of the future, where we've rationalized the movements of all these different actors that were commingled and mixed promiscuously in the cityscapes of, of, of higher cities. Now, because of the rationalization of traffic flows, single direction, um, uh, multiple lane highways, uh, the uh, uh, development of uh, four lane clover type exchanges, um, a whole series of other features, Suddenly, we live in a kind of frictionless utopia where traffic flows can be radically accelerated. In order to see, achieve those accelerations, of course, we give up a couple of things. One of them is that this is a world where there are no pedestrians. Pedestrians have been relegated to a limited space, separated off from the rest of the uh, landscape of mobility. Um, and uh, we also give up a certain sense of connection between the places people work, the places people uh, live, the places they go to play. Uh, um, 
This is a model, by the way. This was a model that was so enormous that it occupied the whole center of the GM pavilion. And this tomorrow land that Bill Gaines dreamed of, um, he imagined it for 1960, and he got it about right because most American cities underwent a major transformation of urban renewals that were required to build highway systems that would create this Tomorrowland today um, in the period roughly between uh, the end of World War II and uh, the 1960s. This is the great period when, um, in a sense, uh, uh, certain kinds of models of development took place that really asserted one value above all, and that is the absolute centrality of the automobile as the vector that unifies all these different now increasingly dislocated and distant places. Uh, so um, these are the cities that we live in today. To some degree, they're all the legacy of this vision, which was a very powerful vision and a transformative vision. But we know the consequences of it. We know how this romance of the road, this world that Marinette dreamed of, is a kind of heroic world, where drivers were these like, kind of superheroes, <laughs> citizens of the future, where it leads, it leads to a world where the speed of crossing major metropolitan areas has been flat or declining for the last 30 plus years. The only mode of transportation that has speeded up during the course of that time are trains, high speed trains. All other modes, including aircraft, because of congestion problems, because of infrastructure problems, have either flattened or declined. That was not the story that Marinetti was prophesying. That was not the vision of progress that uh, Belgenis and others were uh, proclaiming. And of course, the consequences of this model of development on our health, on the environment, are really almost requiring no comment. Uh, uh, we have literally sacrificed our cities on the altar of automobility. It suffices to know, you know, particulars like the fact that in most urban areas, the percentage of territory dedicated to storage of vehicles, not to the movement of vehicles, is close to one-fifth, sometimes it's closer to one-quarter, okay? That's extreme, the world's most valuable real estate. A, quarter, a fifth or a quarter is dedicated to storing vehicles. For whom? For what? To what social end? These are the kinds of questions we have to, I think, ask ourselves. Um, and of course, at the level of individuals, at the level of society, the consequences of this model are ones that we see in public health statistics. We live in a society where there's enormous amount of talk about fitness, about uh, uh, the importance of health, food, and so forth. But the reality is that people move less sitting than they had ever moved in prior um, decades, not to mention going back far before in time. So, we play the, face the consequences of these choices on multiple fronts. So this is the context in which, on the occasion of the book that I was writing to, in a sense, retrace the history of the Piaggio Group and its various adventures in different sectors of mobility, I wrote a manifesto. I'm a scholar of, uh, of the Italian avant-garde. So manifestos are really the defining currency of how you achieve change. I thought it would be fun as an exercise to write such a manifesto. So it's the down with mobility manifesto, up with movability. Uh, movability stands for a model, an alternative model, um, that asks some of these basic questions of values. Where does mobility take us? How does it transport us? How does it bring us pleasure? How does it reinforce the values that we think are fundamental to the kinds of cities, not that we live in, but that we would like to live in, that contribute to the quality of life, to the values that we think are essential. And in doing this, of course, I was explicitly thinking about um, vehicles. I, I happen to just particularly love the Ape, which for Americans is not a very familiar vehicle. So that's the three-wheeler that you see up there. Those are, these are still in production, by the way. They're little tiny vehicles if you've ever spent time in Asia or in India, those are the, you know, basically the top top vehicles. They're like taxis, they're used for everything. It's a scooter that's chopped off with a little truck back end, basically. That's what the op is. And then the Vesla, again, is a very simple vehicle, but it does a couple of fundamental things that really allow people to move around cities and occupy cities in ways that um, are profoundly different. Um, and um, so the work that Piaggio Fast Forward is doing really, 
in a sense, tries to align itself with the DNA of these moments where the answer to the question of what the future of mobility isn't more dislocation between places of work, living, and play. More separation, more enclosure of individuals in their little boxes, in their little cages as they move around the space, but rather some alternative. So I want to introduce you to a vehicle that embodies the notion of movability that I've been trying to articulate here within a kind of philosophical frame. This is Gina, which again is an Italian word that means a short, pleasurable trip. Um, I think the name suggests this idea of returning to pay attention to mobility on the scale of neighborhoods, mobility on the kind of pedestrian scale, uh, not just on the scales of uh, entire cities or regions. Um, Gita is a vehicle that moves at the speed that people move. Uh, its maximum speed is set at the pace, basically, of a slow uh, It wouldn't satisfy a hardcore line. It'd be too slow. It wouldn't be able to keep up. Um, roughly 10 kilometers an hour. And what does Gita do? It carries cargo up to about 20, 21 kilos, 45 pounds. Um, but it also carries uh, electricity with it. It's a power source, and it carries connectivity with it. Um, so it's doing more than just carrying things, uh, although, as I'll go on to suggest, carrying things turns out to be actually a very significant obstacle for people to make pedestrian mobility choices. So it's not a trivial thing, but it, has, it does much more. And I want to emphasize just a couple of other things that I think are really important uh, to understanding the concept behind this uh, vehicle, which is a robot, basically. It's just a speed robot. It's a robot, hopefully, that you want to have rather than that you'd be embarrassed by uh, because you can't get your hand properly or whatever. Um, first of all, it doesn't use GPS. In other words, uh, this is a vehicle that can operate because it uses optical tracking and it's a follow me robot. It's not trying to solve by using machine learning and AI and mapping technologies and sensing technologies. All the complexities of navigating the real cities that we live in through computational power, but rather it's a, it's a vehicle that leverages the expertise of human, a human operator to navigate those complexities. And it does so without relying on GPS, because if you rely on GPS, the minute you leave a GPS uh, accessible domain and you go indoors, for example, or into an area with thick walls, which is GPS and I, you can't navigate it, which is why uh, then you would need maps of internal spaces. Uh, so this is a vehicle that operates across a threshold that's completely defined in the modern history of motorized vehicles, which is indoor and versus outdoor. Gita and vehicles like Gita navigate, operate equally well inside and outside. Uh, the technologies that they rely upon are technologies that leverage the power of human knowledge of how to navigate complex human dense environments and they also uh, you know they are also vehicles that uh, can uh, can work across that uh, that threshold. Um, last but not least perhaps worth mentioning um, these are vehicles that consume extremely low amounts of power. I mean if you look at the actual uh, power cost the carbon footprint so to speak of even electric cars. If you look at the full footprint, you don't just look at the immediate consumption patterns of uh, uh, fuel. Uh, they're actually not that much greener than diesel cars. There was just a piece that came out today showing that the overall carbon footprint of uh, the larger Tesla vehicles is actually is worse than, uh, than Mercedes Turbo diesel. Uh, just to give you an idea. So the, the notion that somehow electrification is going to solve all our problems is one that we need to go beyond. We need to also think about what the typology of the vehicles will be that, uh, that characterizes the mobility models of the future. So Gita uh, is just the first of these kinds of vehicles. We're developing a whole family of them. Um, the idea is this is a vehicle for people. It's a vehicle that will uh, condition the, the mobility choices that people make. Um, that will solve, yes, practical problems, but that would also have a magical element to it, an element that will surprise, that will delight, that will 
um, add a kind of qualitative vector that's essential to the, the successful adoption of new technologies. Uh, so Jita, which is a follow me robot, is hardly the first vehicle that uh, aspires to, to be a smart vehicle. In other words, to use all kinds of sensing capabilities and computational powers to, to move around the world. Uh, the dream of autonomous vehicles is one that goes way back. Um, certainly, most people would tell the story starting sometime around now. Uh, I was a graduate student at Stanford in, uh, in the late 1970s, and this vehicle, which was originally made in 1966, the so called Stanford cart, and it literally was a cart, by the way, it's just like a flat. And <laughs> with a bunch of computers all the way around it and, uh, and some, some, uh, some electric motors, as you can see, and uh, it really cobbled together out of auto, out of auto parts. The Stanford cart was still moving around campus and crashing into all kinds of stuff when I was a graduate student. People were, 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 were graduate students were still playing with it, basically. Um, but you know, this process which goes back to the moon landing vehicles in the 60s that eventually will that will eventuate in the Google car and the Waymo cars and so forth um, is a process that has a long, long history. This is not a new set of technologies or a new set of challenges. And obviously, in the history of the development of these kinds of vehicles, a lot of huge technological leaps have been carried out, especially over the course of the last 20 years. We have uh, relatively low-cost sensors, infrared uh, among them, we have uh, LIDARs, which are laser-based devices. Uh, typically, the LIDARs that you see on top of the Google car or the Waymo cars, these are like $20,000 LIDARs that are on top of the car. These are not going to be you know, your starter economy vehicles. Um, if you add all of the machinery that makes them intelligent, it's uh, a pretty heavy load in terms of uh, the cost level still. But some of those costs are coming down. We have the ability of all kinds of low-cost camera systems to be integrated into the navigation and tracking systems. Um, and all of these technologies have gotten us much, much closer to being able to develop plausible, reliable, and robust systems for navigating the complexities of roadway systems. Um, except there's a problem. There's actually a couple of problems. You're, you're looking at one expression of that problem. With all of that machinery, with all of the smarts, autonomous vehicles, when they're out testing, they work pretty like, well in the laboratory. They work great in the laboratory. But when you put them out on the streets, there are human drivers. And autonomous cars don't get into accidents very often by themselves. It's almost always the interaction between autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, and human drivers. So here's an accident report from California. This one is only a couple months old. It's a GM autonomous vehicle. The autonomous car had stopped, right? It had stopped and it got rear-ended by a human driver. And it suffered serious damages. That turns out to be an extremely frequent scenario when you look at what happens to uh, in vehicular accidents with autonomous and self-driving vehicles. 57% of those accidents are rear-end accidents, where uh, the software is driving, it's not the human driver, and a human-driven vehicle rear-ends them. And the other, uh, by the way, the other 29% of those accidents are side slides. Very similar scenario. Uh, because the software is driving in a particular way, the human drivers perform actions that lead to satisfy the uh, autonomous vehicle software. What's the problem? The problem is that software drivers are incredibly rigorous and narrow-minded in their interpretation of the landscape that they travel in. They are very, they're so obedient that they completely abandon all of the real rules of the road, not the ones that are in the regulation books, not the single signs that are posted along the road. It's all of those implicit and interactive and dynamic features of, of a highway system that try to be really hard for the software to understand. They are not, artificial intelligence is not a general intelligence. It's a very narrow intelligence. 
And when it operates in a completely controlled environment, it does great. When you put it in an environment where you have highly complex interactive forms of interaction that are not easy to reduce to abstract principles, rules, laws, they have, it has trouble. Uh, which is to say that the more you keep people away from the world of autonomous mobility, the better autonomous mobility does. Uh, this is the kind of problem that, uh, that, uh, that um, self-driving cars have a, big, a real big problem with. So what are the snowmen planning to do? Are they going to cross the street? Should I stop? They're all lined up. They're dressed. Uh, now, any five-year-old can tell you that this is not a problem, right? But, but, but an AI doesn't know what snow is, OK? And this is, of course, an extreme iteration of a problem that becomes a very key navigational problem for uh, a vehicle traversing a high-density environment, which is here we have a pedestrian. What is that pedestrian? How do I, as a human driver, know what she's going to do? Well, we exchange glances. There's a language of gesture. Somebody pushes a little bit, pulls back. You know, there's this whole very complex system, which is a culture. It's not a set of rules. In every a culture is made up of complexities, contradictions, impl impl implicit views, explicit views that often conflict with one another. Uh, it's all those nuances that create havoc when you're trying to codify the world into a kind of billiard ball smooth consistency. And there's other problems that are connected to a highway system, like you see on the left, with all its signs, its markers. An autonomous vehicle works great right there. And that's why we're going to see tr autonomous trucks out on superhighways way before we see autonomous cars in cities. But, there's nothing more fun and more easy than to prank autonomous vehicles. <laughs> Turning in all the students thought it'd be fun to change the pace, the stripes, and parking lot. So a vehicle that knows how to park itself doesn't know how to park itself when the stripes don't behave. And this is the work by James Brattle, which I, if I had the video, it would be more fun to show, uh, where James Brattle drew a, a picture that an autonomous car can't read. Uh, the car found it, it makes itself its way autonomous. I want to stay in the circle, and then get out. Because it's been told, if there's a continuous line, don't cross it. It's a system law. If there's a straight line, you can go out, except the straight line is on the outside. Right? Um, these are perfect examples of the rigidity that characterizes these systems. So we have to really cut through the hype and really start thinking about what the consequences are of the world where we're going to attribute to these kinds of smart vehicles dominance over the design of the places where we as human beings congregate and interact. The deeper problem, the deeper problem that goes even beyond these, some of these problems are, can be addressed technically. You can upgrade the software. There's a lot of things you can do. But there's a deeper problem even than that. And that is a problem that was called attention to by this, uh, this um, <clears throat> Uh, experiment, uh, the Moral Machine Experiment, which was uh, published just uh, in the last year in, uh, in science. Um, and it's, it's a familiar problem to moral philosophy. It's a problem that's been talked about for over two centuries, the so-called trolley problem. Some of you will be familiar with it. So the trolley problem in its classical instance has to do with trolleys. What, should, what choice should a trolley make that has a couple of tracks and a couple of options? Here's the autonomous vehicle version of the trolley problem. Okay, so you have three passengers, young passengers, riding in an autonomous vehicle, and there's three elderly people quite properly crossing on the, at the pedestrian crossing on the white stripes, the street, and the brakes, the brakes get out. So what should the software choose? Should it kill the old people who were obeying the pedestrian laws uh, and save it for the three young people who have old lights ahead of them? Who is, um, of course, we, you know, lots of good reasons for, say, sparing the, the passengers. Or should we, we sacrifice the, uh, the, uh, the, the young people riding in the car to spare the lives of the, the three elderly pedestrians who, after all, are behaving the rules of the and, uh, uh, and certainly deserve to fulfill and finish their lives. Uh, 
uh, without being uh, mowed down by an automobile. Uh, so big surprise to uh, engineers, but not a big surprise to philosophers and to study students of human culture. The answer to these questions are cultural. There isn't a, a, a right answer to who should be sacrificed in answering the trolley question with autonomous vehicles. And guess what? They're really strongly cultural. When you look at the kinds of responses that people give, there's an area of overlap. But for example, in Western societies, there's a preference for inaction. Like most people say, uh, better not to intervene. The stalker should just shut up and say so. Right? Let happen whatever is meant to happen. That's, that's a philosophical stance that many people adopt. In the case of research societies, I find this one really fascinating. Sparing the lawful is a much higher priority than just letting let stuff just happen because it's already underway. Or uh, let's spare pedestrians. Maybe pedestrians deserve a particular form of attention, value attribution that's distinctive. And in the case of Southern societies, this is maybe the, the most comical one. I, mean, I don't want to swear on these statistics, by the way. They're just an example. The complexity of these kinds of decisions in, in, the, in the southern hemisphere, the dominant answers were higher status individuals and women deserve to have the highest ranking in terms of the decisions about how it was on the trial. Right? So those are three really fundamental different ways of emphasizing the correct answer. Uh, so to come back to tomorrow night, this dream of future cities. Uh, which I think, as this graphic suggests, looks strangely like one of Bill Getty's vision of the future city, of that city of frictionless, kind of utopian frictionless traffic system. Um, notice the complete absence of human beings. Also notice that in order to implement this vision of the smart city, sponsored by Ford Motor Company in this case, of course, we have to achieve this goal, which is to separate people out from the smart, so-called smart systems that are going to be dominant features of much of the mobility landscape, these intelligent self-driving cars. And the, the real challenge is to get, let's say that right now, let's assume that we're at about 88% of efficiency. But if we, lose, we let autonomous self-driving cars out in the streets of Columbus today, they probably go for at least 88% of life. Now, a few victims here and there. How much worse is that than, than human drivers? Who knows, right? But to get to 98% or 100%, what do we have to do? Well, I think as you've been um, guessing, we have to turn humans into passengers, into sheep. We have to, we have to herd them. We have to keep them away from the autonomous vehicles for the good of the autonomous vehicles. And it's not surprising that in the uh, some small sectors of the engineering, community involved in the development of autonomous vehicles, I've actually heard engineers argue that we have to retrain humans to become more like robots. Right? That that's the solution, right? I, I think it's a low probability solution, but I think it tells you something about the, technic the, the kind of technicism of the worldview that's shaken in these projects. So at the end of the fast forward, we adopted a different kind of perspective. My colleague, Greg Lynn, and I are co-founders of the company with the Dato Group leadership. And our focus has really been on trying to imagine how we can take that whole set of technologies and use it in a human-centered way. In other words, to create vehicles not that move in an ideal path from point X to point Y, but rather that move the way that people move. And moving the way that people move is truly an amazingly complex challenge. You might not think that because you and I and every other human being who walks around the world who spend our whole lives training to do things that we don't think about, but that are extremely complex. And we perform these actions continuously as we move through crowded spaces, as we move down hallways. And that navigational system is a system that's not only deeply wired into who we are, but it, it also poses real challenges for machines to understand. That's the, the focus of a lot of the work we've been doing. And we're calling it autonomy for humans. As you can imagine, it's a little bit of a, a kind of polemical choice. But to suggest that maybe the conversation about autonomy should be a conversation about autonomy for whom. And of course, not 
for machines, but rather for a kind of vision of the future city, the present city that we want to live in. Um, so autonomy for humans is really just a way of recapturing the world autonomy, world autonomy and connecting it, especially to the, the form of autonomy that's the most fundamental one, to human being and to human history, which is walking. That's how we express our autonomy in the most pure possible sense. So what do vehicles like, like uh, Jita do? This is a prototype version that you're seeing when we're testing in the streets of Los Angeles. Um, they are a, 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 essentially a, a vehicle that um, serves as a transporter. They're a platform that carries connectivity and electrical power. And they move with people. They leverage the, power, the knowledge that people have in terms of in, in respect to navigating the kinds of spaces that are human scale spaces, that are the kinds of complex spaces where we carry out most of our existences. Uh, and they're really not meant as the, the solution to the future of mobility. They're one very small piece in a very large and complex mobility ecology where automobiles will be present. I'm not against automobiles. I just don't think that automobiles should be the protagonists of the 21st century the way that they were the protagonists of the 20th century. That's the argument. And as you have no doubt experienced, because I saw quite a, quite a number of electric scooters and the sidewalks and streets of Columbus, micromobility was not even on the table as part of the conversation about the future of mobility 10 years ago. But micromobility, and this is the argument that I'd like to make, is actually where the real revolution is going to happen. And if you start to think about what a cityscape looks like, and you redesign it around micromobility, not automobility, it's a, it's a different world, and it's one that's a lot closer to models uh, that have been emerging over the course of the last couple of decades. Um, all of you are familiar with the increasing centrality of pedestrian-only zones in uh, uh, especially urban centers. So at PFF, we're, our focus is really on these three different phenomena that we see all as features of an emerging model of society that uh, meets vehicular supports. It needs vectors that are going to enable it to uh, be achieved. One of them is the integration of live, work, and play spaces. The second is the beginnings of kind of development against street culture, desire for reconnection somehow to place, to people. And the third is connected to the outdoors. Uh, a strong connection between indoors and outdoors. Uh, and that doesn't imply that mobile devices go away or that screens, screens go away or connectivity goes away. It, it's, a, it's a question of reconnecting them in a new way, under new terms. Um, so walking. Americans, and like most people in the world, they, they love walking in principle. 80% of US citizens think it's desirable. It's economical. Power, it's very practical, there's a million reasons it's good for you. You know, people will come up with lots of lots of reasons. But guess what? Out of that 80%, only 10% actually walk. That tells you something, right? So why good? Why doesn't that claim at least to be predisposed to walk turn into walking as a choice? Um, and I think you know some of the answers to that question. People know that walking is good for exercise, uh, it's healthful, their doctors are telling them. Uh, neighborhood walks have all kinds of positive contributions to the quality of life assessed from a number of different standpoints. And the correlation between walking and bicycling to work, for example, and, and public health is absolutely Overwhelming. I mean, it's extraordinary. Look at, for example, Fort Worth, Texas, where 3%, 2% of the population either bikes or walks to work, and the presence of almost one third of the population is obese, just as a, a, a typical example of uh, the consequences. And, you know, short trips. That kind of neighborhood scale of mobility contributes to not only environmental well-being, but also to uh, a reinforcing of, of civic bonds and so forth. And the shocking fact in the United States in particular is that a lot of that driving is on a pedestrian scale. 20% uh, of driving trips are one mile or less, and about 30% are two miles or less. That's a pedestrian scale. So people are making choices. And there are reasons for those choices, of course. So our focus has been on trying to create vehicles that 
use machine intelligence to the degree that it is a form of intelligence to understand the rules of not the road, but of the sidewalk, of the corridor, the lobby, the places that humans move around, pedestrian etiquette. And that's an incredibly complex uh, task, as it turns out. Um, and um, and GEDA is a vehicle that uses a series of sensing capabilities much, it's exactly the same equipment you would find on one of those Waymo or Google car vehicles, much cheaper, much more reduced, but basically used to try to understand, interpret, and adapt to uh, the etiquette of human interactions in space, uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, pedestrian space. So if you look at how GEDA views the world, and again, I'm just using GEDA here as the first example. I'm imagining a world where there'd be a lot of vehicles like this. But GEDA is out there doing scanning the environment very much like, uh, like you do when you uh, adjust your position on the sidewalk to accommodate people who are coming in an opposite way or similar kinds of tasks. But of course, it doesn't see the world the way that you see the world. It has a fundamental different, fundamentally different cognitive apparatus. And it's important to understand that within that difference, it's not going to be easy to just teach these vehicles to behave as if they were a human, without the presence of a human, uh, without all of that kind of training that we have to become competent pedestrians. And last but not least, I want to just mention, of course, that the world of mobility is not open to all of us. So one of the, uh, one of the, the, the I think, biggest opportunities and challenges is how do we create, by giving what rise to these new categories of vehicles that are part of a larger mobility of infrastructure. How do we serve those who uh, struggle moving around the cities of today? Curb cuts are great, but if you can't transport two bags of groceries, and by the way, I've never seen a wheelchair that transports two bags of, of groceries. That sounds like a really trivial technical problem, but uh, the, as far as I know, they don't exist, right? So, these are supports that also expand the compass of mobility and extend mobility to sectors of the population that are not well served by the automobile-centric model. I'm going to close here with another manifesto. This is an animated one, and um, after that we can uh, open up a discussion. Okay, let me see if I can get it. There we go. Thank you.
anthropologists, interestingly enough. And if you think about not just how people move, but how they move in the company of, right, another intelligent agent. Like, what are the models of it? Well, pets are, especially dogs, but other animals are actually probably the closest you get, aside from humans moving around with other humans, to uh, being able to study the kind of interactions. And our, the focus of our work, I would say, 80% of it is really interaction, human-robot interaction. We think that that's really the key to a future where smart devices, smart vehicles, really matter and transform human choices. Uh, it's got to be highly intuitive. It's got to be kind of frictionless, seamless, and there can't be a little screen in front of people all the time for that to really become a kind of feature of human life choices. And so I think what you saw it is um, exactly what we think of as like the kind of secret sauce or the, the focus of a lot of our de design and development work. We look at animal models all the time. Uh, we look at, we're, we look not just at dogs, but also, believe it or not, at uh, alpacas, mules, horses, um, uh, uh, hawks, <laughs> um, anything that involves humans interacting with another mobile smart agent. And, and actually, look from, those, uh, from, from that process, it was super, super interesting. Not immediately things you can apply, but, but just uh, insights into the complexity of the way that an interaction happens, the way it's communicated, the way there are certain gestures that, that trigger uh, a reaction, a response. Um, and that extends in particular to the way humans interact with humans. So how do people walk together? Like, how do you know when you're, you know, um, like at what point do you adjust your path on the sidewalk when you see somebody coming the other way exactly on your line of uh, uh, your trajectory, for example. Um, how close is too close? Um, you know, should you the park, you know, one foot back, two feet back, should you follow at a fixed distance or should you be responsive to different factors? Those are exactly the kinds of questions that become crucial to designing the interaction. And animal models are, are probably the most interesting and richest example because, of course, Gita is not a humanoid robot. And I think one of the biggest beefs I have about the whole robotics community, not the people who make industrial robots, who I'm a big fan of, but people who develop companion robots, you know, uh, is that robots do a really bad job at being human beings, right? <laughs> they, they are inevitably failing at the basic tasks of human interaction. Like you can spend millions of dollars, and I know of a specific uh, project of this kind, trying to get a robot to give you a proper handshake. <laughs> and that's just the beginning of a social interaction. So maybe we could just get away from the sort of you know, sci-fi fantasy of robots as our doubles or you know, humanoid doppelgangers and, and really focus on what robots do well. And they do certain things excruciatingly well, like to perform high precision tasks at high speed. They also can do a lot of things that support and, and, and aid human behaviors and human choices. And that's the kind of direction that we've been um, focusing on. Uh, yeah, Tom. Uh, great talk. Tons of stuff back there. And so I had uh, an observation and question that I think are related, but I think we can to mm -hmm. it, so that's your job. Uh, so the first, the observation is something we were talking about in my history class today, is driving recent cultural practice coming out of modernism to re-establish pleasure as a driving force, so the Vitruvian triad of commodity, firmness, and delight. Yeah. Turn, the light goes away and you get form yeah. all this time. Right? Yeah. So I think you're very much a part of that. And the related question, and I applaud you for that, uh, the related question then is, um, has to do with, I think, a little bit of accessibility. So these are, they sure look expensive, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do, at a kind of micro scale, have kind of issues having to do with parking and storage and charging and all that stuff. And I wonder if you and Greg and the EFF team have begun looking at sharing models mm -hmm. that would kind of you know, so the, the bird scooter, the ecology version of the G4. Um, so, um, uh, 
Yes, absolutely, on the, the first point that you made. I think, um, and I, I think you can see that one of the defining driving kind of objectives in the development of these vehicles was to make them pleasurable vehicles. In other words, not sort of you know, humanoid robots that fail at being human enough or, or they're too human and get into the uncanny you know, valley. Uh, but rather being something else, something other, and an object that has uh, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a strong kind of design ethos to it. Uh, the, um, uh, and we think, believe firmly that not only being able to really design the human-robot interaction to be seamless and intuitive, but also the physical object is essential to the adoption and to the choices that people will make. Uh, on the second point, we have we've, we've certainly thought about the idea that the, there might be uh, the sharing kind of economy or model, like the notion of fleets of these kinds of vehicles, just like bicycles and sometimes electric scooters, are increasingly integrated into uh, uh, you know pieces of infrastructure, if you like, that are publicly available. Um, for a bunch of reasons, we decided to focus initially on the consumer market. We thought it was it was more challenging. And our cost levels, even though I'm not at liberty to disclose the, the purchase cost of Gita uh, quite yet, um, it, it, compared to the kinds of robots, even those little clunky delivery robots, the fully autonomous delivery robots that we've seen, I can say that we are 80% um, cheaper. Um, so we are really shooting for, I think the Vespa model is a model that we take seriously in the sense that we want to start by getting individuals as consumers to make these choices. Again, maybe it's instead of the second car, I live in a high enough density area that I could go for a walk, pick up groceries, perform tasks that I would otherwise perform in the second car by choosing a vehicle like this. And then gradually, I think we will look at sharing type, more infrastructural models. Um, but we're pretty persuaded, just based also on our experience of testing them in different places, that people develop a kind of you know, a, 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 a sort of uh, effective relationship to these vehicles very quickly. They start to think of them like they're, and this comes back to the question of animals, like their dog, their pet. Uh, they, you, you name your Gita. Gita isn't called Gita. Uh, when you uh, first log into your Gita, you unbox it, uh, you get to name it, you share it with your crew, it's a social object. So. Our model is a little bit more oriented towards that kind of a model rather than the kind of urban infrastructure model where uh, fleets of vehicles might be available. Uh, but, uh, but it doesn't exclude. So, I'm going to think it's really But that's just the beginning of the story. Once you're starting 
to develop intelligent behaviors on the part of a robotic vehicle, you, if, if you prefer to be able to walk and have uh, with your, your dog healing behind you at a 45 degree angle, that's very easy to do. That's not difficult. It's just a navigational task that gets added into the stack of behavior. So, so the point is, we start with the, the, the kind of core of the mission and functionality, but we build from that. We build the directions that are meaningful to people. So I, I see this as a way of resetting the clock, if you like, as I try to suggest. Getting back to looking at walking as an intelligent activity, not the activity for the poor SOBs who don't have a car, you know, who you know, miss the bus, um, who have no other choice, but rather as being a little bit cool, like skateboarding or you know, going on your little electric scooter or doing something that's fun, right? That that's part of the spirit of this venture. And, you know, we'll only succeed in what we have. I don't know, the market will be the judge ultimately. We're going to we'll be going to the market by the end of this year in the US market, which is probably the world's hardest market to transform because of the lack of kind of very kind of hardcore pedestrian culture in so many uh, American immigrants as a result of the developments of the 20th century. So, you know, it's one step at a time, always. Uh, but, uh, but what excites me in response to your question is, this is just the beginning of a uh, step towards a, a world where smart vehicles can do a lot of different things. Like imagine a vehicle, I mentioned this just in passing, but a vehicle that carries power and connectivity with wherever you go, and it follows you. When you plug into the system, you can do a lot of things you already do, maybe more interestingly or better. Like everything from cooling the beer, right, to maybe you want to travel around, maybe you're a field reporter, and instead of having a crew of four people carrying the same camera, you want a ride vehicle that follows you, captures 360, 4K, high def, uh, in, to a location where things are happening, and you just walk. You don't need a van. You don't need. That's that's just you know hinting at the cultural and kind of social impact of having a lot of these kinds of platforms out there, of which I would imagine our vehicles would just be just one. There would be lots of other options out there. So I, I think, that, again, we're at the beginning of a transformation. We'll see where, where it leads us. One last question? OK. Go ahead. Uh, so you talked about technology. Gia communicates with lights and sound as well as through its movements. 
So we spent a lot of time. We didn't want it to talk. We wanted it to speak a language that would be intelligible intuitively without reading the manual to people, but so that you're not looking around all the time saying, oh, it's GFO. Are you going to lose my GFO? <laughs> um, you're hearing reassuring sounds, but once you don't, it drives you crazy or become a hindrance with respect to other people's response. So it's like all of those little fine points, which are like creating a creature. You know, it's like it is the pet again. <laughs> Um, and the same for lights. Like, what are the lighting effects? I don't know if you notice the logo of Gia is the same pattern as the wheels with LEDs under the, the little side covers so that you see the logo spin as the vehicle goes, right? So it's those kinds of little refinements, I think, that capture a lot of the, the, uh, those, uh, the, those kinds of pleasurable, you know, I, I don't think they're purely aesthetic. I think they're functional, but they're functional driven desire to create a little bit of magic, some functional magic.